Well, good morning and welcome to the ninth meeting of the Economy, Energy and Fair Work Committee for 2019. Um, the, uh, first of all, I would ask everyone present to turn off any electrical devices that may interfere with the sound system. The actual sound system will be operated from the sound desk, so no need for our witnesses when we come to that to press any buttons. Um, we've received apologies from committee members Andy Whiteman and Gordon MacDonald, and we'd welcome Willie Coffey, who is here in Gordon MacDonald's stead. The first item on the agenda is a decision by the committee to take items three and four in private. Are we agreed on that? Agreed. Thank you. Um, we now turn to our inquiry into construction and Scotland's economy, and uh, we have witnesses today. Uh, first of all, Stephen Good, who is the Chief Executive from Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, and then Professor Robert Hairstans, from, who is the Head of Centre of the Offsite Construction and Innovative Structures from Napier University, and also with us is Alan Caldwell, uh, Strategic Director of Research and Innovation from the Robertson Group. Um, so I welcome those three. I think we have a further witness uh, who's perhaps been delayed en route, but we'll start off. Um, and <clears throat> perhaps um, Stephen Good and uh, Professor Herstains may be interested in this question. It's to do with the, the question of innovation. And um, <clears throat> I think Mark Farmer, who's the author of the Farmer Review, uh, highlighted that the UK construction industry faced and I quote, inexorable decline unless long-standing problems were tackled. Um, what are your views on that statement? And in particular, um, the impression seems to be that the sector is slow to embrace innovation or to modernize, to automate, to adopt new techniques which are used quite commonly in other countries, um, similar countries. So what would be your views on that? Yeah, sure. Um, I think the farmer report has obviously got a lot of resonance at the moment, um, but it's one in a sequence of reports as such. Um, we've obviously had uh, the Leatham and Egan reports, the Barker reports, etc., the construction strategy. Um, so there's a, a whole back catalogue um, of work uh, and research, etc., um, which have consistently said the construction sector doesn't perform. Um, and there's a necessity for it to think more innovatively in terms of its approach. Um, obviously, the parallels are often drawn with other sectors, such as the automotive, etc., and how they've actually embraced change in terms of what they've done, uh, with a large emphasis on productivity uh, and production improvements uh, and lean and uh, customer-orientated products, etc. Um, so the construction sector essentially uh, is fragmented. Um, uh, innovation is, you know, it's it's hard to come by because of um, the risks associated with it uh, and the culture by which it operates. And um, and correspondingly, you know, the uptake of methods of construction and new methods of construction that are, in many respects, as a correspondence to, to intersection of drivers. And there's a number of drivers which influence that. Uh, and those drivers have become more complex in the modern setting. Uh, with the onset of things like digitisation. So if you take culture, productivity, human capital, um, sustainability, uh, productivity, um, the necessity uh, to, to try and um, respond to all of those challenges within the, the social, economic and political landscape in the context of, of, the, of the sector, then there's a lot of challenges at place which to resolve to innovative approaches uh, and for those in innovation to be ideally, uh, you know, client or customer or led, um, there's, you know, it, it, it hasn't taken place and there's a necessity to, for it to, to happen, given, you know, what we need to do and what we need to, what we need to change. Yeah, I would maybe add, um, we were fortunate enough um, to have a Mark Farmer join our board last year because uh, I think he recognised, and he's a huge supporter of the industry, a huge supporter of uh, driving change, positive change, growth within the industry. Um, but as Robert touched on, you know, going back, you know, the, 
the furthest back one that I've ever seen is the Simon Report in 1944, which outlined a lot of the challenges that the industry has uh, and suggested a lot of the ways that industry could change. Um, and one of the key observations uh, that the Farmer Review focused on was that relationship, and it's really important, I think, in the context of probably everything to do with innovation, that relationship between the industry and clients uh, and how clients buy from the industry. Uh, Mark and others have made the point that actually the industry is perfectly well set up to deliver solutions for the, the uh, clients the way clients want to buy from it. So if the perception is we want um, lowest cost, we want quick delivery, we want to transfer risk, then the industry is perfectly well set up to do that. The challenge is we may not want that, we may want a different industry, we may want that industry to change. Um, and the farmer reviews, you know, modernise or, or die message or the vision, I suppose, was that if, um, and again, Robert touched on uh, Egan and Latham reports from the, uh, the, the 90s, both identified again the real important role that clients, often public sector clients, being one of the biggest um, procurers of goods and services from the construction industry, um, if they could use some of those levers um, to drive innovation, to drive investment in skills, to drive investment in technology, um, equipment, uh, new facilities, um, that would give the industry a lot of confidence. Organisations like Robertson Group, I suppose, um, would see that line of sight and see that potential to invest because um, there is a, a, a longer um, term strategy perhaps in place around how uh, clients want to buy those products. So. Um, I suppose the, the die part of the modernizer die agenda was if industry and clients choose not to do that, the potential future might look quite bleak. So is the problem in this country, we talk a lot about it, but don't actually do it, whereas in other countries they get on with it and do it? Um, I think perhaps the, the it's an interesting area in terms of um, policy and procurement, but one of the opportunities, I guess, is to look at how others are delivering that benefit. Uh, I know some of the committee members made it, made it along to visit a, a Glasgow-based um, construction company, off-site manufacturing company, who have invested quite heavily in new technology and, and new skills and, and training techniques and delivering different models. And in some respects, I suppose, as you know, someone who supports a wider adoption of innovation right across the industry, you look at those models and say, why can't more be done? Um, but you have to pick right into the kind of detail of it to understand how their model works and how their structure works and how uh, in the in the relationship they have with their clients, it was probably more advantageous for companies like that to do it, whereas for others, um, it may not be. So, yeah, there is there is eminent sense in looking at how other countries and other uh, and other organisations have embraced change and drive innovation. Um, I think, from our point of view, certainly at the Innovation Centre, it is apparent that there is a, a massive will to do things differently within industry, but it requires that relationship between industry and its clients to work. Um, and have shared objectives, um, outcome-based objectives. Um, I'll turn to Alan Caldwell, who equally will have comments on this, no <laughs> doubt. Um, a massive will, but um, not necessarily put into action as it is in other countries, where the w there's a will and then it happens. Where there's a will, there's a way, surely. I think so. The, I would actually pretty much agree with everything Stephen said from our perspective that, oh sorry, I should correct first, I'm not our research and innovation director, uh, Claire uh, was supposed to be here and I got a phone call yesterday afternoon to see, say she wasn't well and could I possibly step in, I'm a strategic bid director, so heavily involved in the bidding side for, for Robertson. Um, it's very much in our interest to be at the forefront, to, to be looking for new ideas, uh, to develop those ideas. But at the same time, we have to be a sustainable business that can afford to do it. So, as Stephen said, the, the industry is largely set up to, to respond to the way things are procured, which, which as you said, Stephen, is around... Um, it's not only cost, it's very cost-driven, very solution-driven that often is already decided. Um, and to bring innovation into those things, we, we tend to... Would, would prefer to, to take a kind of what's traditionally called a two-stage approach where you maybe get involved, the contractor gets involved much earlier in the process to, and is allowed to bring ideas to, to the table um, at an early stage, bringing our supply chain as well, because at the end of the day, the specialist supply chain often are the sources of a lot of the innovative ideas. So the earlier we can bring them and ourselves to the table to get involved in projects, we tend to find they tend to be more 
um, collaborative as well, which going back to Latham and Egan uh, was one of their lot, probably the largest criticism of our industry as it was very confrontational. And I think if you're being fair across the board, the industry has changed. It's not been a sea change, but the, certainly in my experience, and sadly I've been here long enough, um, I, you know, the confrontational side still exists to a degree, but it's nowhere as near as bad as it was, and there's far more things have been set up over the years. Um, Procure 21 in England was kind of an early NHS um, drive to create a framework where there was incentivization for everyone to collaborate together, not just client and contractor, but uh, clients together, contractors together to bring ideas in. And it, it, it worked to a degree. NHS frameworks in Scotland have tried to copy that a few years back and, and are still pushing that agenda. And there are many other frameworks now have been developed with collaboration at their centre, but I still do very much agree with your comment that the, the will is there. The, the actions still need to come, and they need to come better. Uh, and and it, it's trying to get over an idea that by collaborating, you're not necessarily giving away your crown jewels that give you a competitive advantage, because it, it's a very competitive industry that we're in. Right, thank you. I'll come now to Colin Beatty. Thank you, Mira. Innovation obviously comes at a cost, and typically the cost is up front, and you recover the benefits of that over a period of years. To what extent do you think profit margins are a barrier to innovation? Um, uh, yes, <laughs> you can. As I said, that we're a strange industry. We take a lot of risk, um, depending on the structure of the contract, um, and we don't take, in, in the wider industrial terms, a very high margin f from the work. That's just our industry. Um, so there is a barrier in that your margins are tight and you have to be very efficient. You tend to lean towards what have you done before uh, because you know it's safe, it's secure, and particularly <clears throat> in light of some recent events in construction, you want to make sure you're delivering the quality you need to deliver with a tried and tested solution. So the margins, I think, are certainly a factor in uh, say stifling innovation because at the end of the day, if you innovate, you potentially can create better margins because you're doing things better and faster. So it's trying to get that balance between the two things, I think. Is that, is that balance being achieved? I don't know, uh, to be honest. Probably not my particular field, really, to, to, to say that. But um, there's certainly a desire to, to push innovation as far as we can, but it, it's got to be within affordable limits, if you like, because it... We have to. We've got three and a half thousand employees in the group, and and we're kind of also trying to make sure that they've they'll have a job next year and the year after, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So there is an element of risk in any innovation, but I think it, you know the experience shows that if you if you can manage it and grow it, we, I think as an industry there is it's not a reluctance to do it. It's just a, a caginess, I suppose, to to make sure we're doing the right type of innovation. It's not going to be too risky to threaten the underlying business. Do other Panama animals have a view? I would maybe add. Um, I mean, profit margins obviously have a an impact on a business's ability to look at any you know uh, additional um, work it might undertake or activities it might get involved in an innovation. Uh, you know, investment in skills and training are, are no different. So, uh, I think from that point of view, it's um, it's important. There's a paradox, I suppose, in some respects, that a lot of companies that you would hold up, you know, international uh, companies as being really innovative companies are the ones that appear to take quite a lot of big risks that successfully pay off. Um, and, you know, in the construction industry, again, you know, back to, I suppose, the way it, it's structured, if there isn't the profit margins there, companies won't see the opportunity uh, to invest in innovation, try new um, techniques. In some respects, that's what the Innovation Centre was established to help um, businesses with. Um, have a conversation, I'm sure, about whether that's successful or not uh, later on. But that was certainly one of the ambitions was to help um, try and de-risk innovation for businesses that don't operate on, you know, hugely high profit margins. And um, back to the collaboration point that Alan uh, touched on, um, there are some notable successes where businesses that typically compete, uh, and, and Robertson Group are one of a, a cluster that are, we'll maybe discuss in the context of off-site manufacturing later. But 
Um, they are. That's an example of a group of businesses that are typically competitors who saw the benefit in coming together because the the the, the sum of the whole was better than the parts in some respects. And from an innovation centre point of view, the opportunity for us to support those businesses collectively was much more valuable than the opportunity to support them individually. Uh, and I think they've got a lot out of that process. It's an ongoing journey, but they've um, successfully embraced collaboration because perhaps individually their profit margins wouldn't have allowed them to do as much as they have done together. Perhaps I can broaden out the question. What are the other significant barriers to innovation? pick up in, in many respects what's been said also in terms of that sort of um, lowest cost uh, procurement strategy, low, low profit margin, therefore difficult, difficult to invest in research and innovation. Um, and often the research and innovation piece is around how you can actually add value in the value proposition of what you're doing in the, in the wider scale. So there's that social, economic and environmental benefits and correspondingly how product and process innovation can can resolve to that larger value proposition piece. Um, and if that's more apparent and more transparent um, to, the, to the client, to the sector, to the to end user, then that can help to start trying to pull research and innovation through through the system. Uh, and if you have a more integrated um, sort of supply chain uh, and there's, there's an enhanced level of digitization, um, then that can help to, to again, uh, you know, pull that innovation and research through, through the through the process, and obviously from our standpoint, engaging with with academia uh, and and encouraging the new skills uh, which are necessary to to drive that innovation is is, is fundamentally important. To, to what extent is innovation reserved to the bigger construction companies? In other words, can the small construction companies innovate in their own way, or do they have to plug into what the big boys are doing? No. You could talk to yeah. that as well, Stephen. But yeah, that's a lot. Our, a lot of our engagement is indeed with SMEs, because they're often those that are coming to us with research and innovation ideas. That's not to say that larger groups aren't doing it, but they came. They would tend to keep that more in house. I would suspect if they are doing it, whereas the SMEs often don't have the internal resource, um, so they may well have the ideas. But they're certainly our client base, so to speak, has historically been largely SMEs. I mean, the majority of the industry in Scotland is SME-based. The majority of the projects Innovation Centre has supported have been led by or uh, in collaboration partnerships with SMEs. Uh, that is often where the innovation comes from, um, particularly as you go down the supply chain. I'll maybe touch on that from a main contracting point of view, but often the, the tier one main contractors are assemblers of you know specialist teams that deliver um, solutions for clients and those specialist teams have to innovate to develop their competitive edge um, the, that's not to say that the tier ones ha don't have a hugely important role in you know in bringing together those teams to drive innovation and particularly when they start to collaborate across uh, different groups that's where um, that's where in some respects the the really exciting innovation potentially comes the transformational innovation comes but SMEs um, Albeit, yes, the perception is often that they are, you know, busy trying to figure out how to get paid tomorrow, uh, are actually a, a, a really rich, um, a really rich kind of um, base for innovation within the industry because, in some respects, they have to look at a whole bunch of different ways of doing things. One last quick question: um, the new construction Scotland strategy includes productivity and innovation as a priority. Um, is that proposed vision and the actions related to that likely to achieve change? I think, so the, yeah, so when it, looking at the strategy, um, there's an emphasis on digitisation, off-site construction. Um, Farmer regards that as pre-manufacture because it's essentially about um, ways and not generating waste on site. So whether that's a full volumetric, fully enhanced, uh, unit or whether it's a sub-assembly which is pre-manufactured to, you know, to eradicate waste on, on site. Um, so I think, uh, you know, digitisation is, is here, it's the fourth industrial revolution as such. Um, there's a necessity to, to embrace it, there's opportunity to, to create digital twins of what's been, been constructed, uh, to interrogate it and do scenario planning, etc. <coughs> so in that sense, digitisation should facilitate, um, you know, uh, Im improvements. Uh, and if you can create a feedback loop from, you know, what's happening <coughs> through the sort of um, the construct the manufacture construction phase, uh, the 
the the in situ erection, the the uh, the life cycle analysis, the, the consumer engagement with it, etc., and feed that back into the digital model. Um, then you can start to enrich it uh, and understand fully what's actually taking place relative to what was um, what was uh, predicted, uh, and correspondingly identify product and process innovation as such, um, and productivity as well. Uh, you know, as part of that as part of that process, you can identify areas for for uh, productivity improvement. Um, and ideally, going to, like, I would obviously advocate a more industrialised approach to that, a more manufacturer-based approach. And as I say, that not that doesn't necessarily mean full volumetric modular units produced off-site. There's definitely a place for that, uh, but it can be sub-assemblies um, that are pre-manufactured, uh, such that th those component parts can be brought together on-site as efficiently and effectively as, as possible. Um, and it's, it's the management and the logistical arrangements to do that and correspond with the new skill sets which are required for that type of delivery model. So it has to be a, it has to be a, a holistic answer uh, and, and a holistic decision making making process. And those two components are are important to it. If I can maybe chip in a little bit there, there there's it goes right back as you said to, to designing it in the first place, and not not all projects and sites are suitable for off-site manufacture, we've used quite a variety of it from, you know, bathroom pods through to whole a, a corridor that is com comes, you know, completely constructed and just gets plonked uh, to one of a technical term. But um, and they they've all got their place, but they're not all suitable for all solutions. And it breaks down even to mechanical and electrical service runs and corridors that we pre-manufacture off-site, so that it's not just waste, it's quality, it's health and safety. There's a whole raft of very good reasons why you'd want to construct as much off-site as possible. And, and we actually do that, but the last final challenge, unfortunately, is still cost. And it's not yet clear that doing that is cheaper. And a lot of the clients will say, well, it's okay, I'll, I'll wait another couple of months. Or I'll, I'd, if you can do it 5% cheaper traditionally, that's fine. So at the end of the day, we still have to win the project. So while we can offer innovation, offer these solutions, the procurement route sometimes can will dictate that they're not adopted. Um, John Mason. Uh, thanks very much, convener. Um, if we can focus maybe on the Constru uh, Construction Scotland Innovation Centre for a bit. Um, first of all, c can you just explain to us, because I think there has been some confusion, between what is the relationship between Construction Scotland and the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre? Sure. Um, yeah, appreciate that that is uh, often cited. Uh, so, um, not to give everybody too long a history lesson, but Construction Scotland Industry Leadership Group formed in 2011, 12, I think, um, as the, uh, the kind of follow on from previous uh, kind of industry wide leadership groups as opposed to perhaps specific interest groups, um, was a uh, had a series of working groups. Um, one of those working groups was the Innovation Working Group, the Innovation Working Group, um, of which I was asked to chair at the time, um, was asked to explore whether a call at the time that came out from Scottish Funding Council um, for innovation centres, the Innovation Centre programme, was uh, worthy of a response from the construction industry. Um, after a few iterations, uh, a bid was pulled together, a submission was made, and it made sense at the time for uh, the Construction Scotland Industry Leadership Group um, to uh, put forward a proposition for a Construction Scotland Innovation Centre. Um, the smart thinking, the vision at that point was that you would have an industry leadership group which, despite having an incredibly tough job to do to unite a pretty disparate industry, um, would be able to do the communicating with industry as an industry leadership group, whilst if um, funded, would have an innovation centre uh, that could act in partnership, work in collaboration under a united brand with a united um, web you know, platform portal and activity that was interlinked to allow uh, the two to um, work hand in glove effectively around the, the, you know, the, the complementary issues, I suppose, around leadership and culture change within industry, driven by the, the industry leadership group and the innovation work um, 
plugging in the academic base uh, to drive that. So came out, or it was an idea yeah, from it was, Construction well, Scotland. It was it was developed from uh, a working group within right. Construction but, but Scotland. But legally, they now are two separate organisations. Yeah, they, uh, well, they were always intended. There was a separate governance structure, separate funding structure for the innovation centre programme. So all eight innovation centres uh, have a have guidance. I suppose they work around, and the industry leadership group endorsed that approach at the at the beginning. Right. Um, the the challenge. Uh, moving forward, this how do we ensure that there's uh, as close alignment as is necessary for two organisations that have got very well aligned objectives around driving change and growth within the industry, um, but have different governance, different finance, different legal structures. Relationship so, now as it should be? or um, I think the relationship uh, has the potential to grow into something really powerful. Okay. Uh, I think there's a real opportunity for, I mean, we've responded to the, the strategy and, and offered support across all the working group uh, areas, so all the six priority areas within the strategy align very well with the areas that we, in response to our industry-led board, industry demand that we see. Uh, there, there's huge alignment there, so there's no reason why it shouldn't. Okay, I'll focus on the word potential, that's always a good word. Um, now, looking at f phases and targets and things like that, as I understand it, phase one has completed, that was 2013 to 18, and we're heading towards phase two. And you, I think you gave us a report, or uh, the organisation gave us a report, as to some of the achievements uh, between 2013 and 18, uh, for example, supporting over 230 innovation projects, engaging over 1,350 businesses. Th th these actual figures... Uh, I'm not sure if we've seen targets, you know, like was the 230 better than you were hoping or not as good, or were the targets not as specific as that? Uh, no, the targets were very specific. Um, so the industry steering group at the time when the bid was put together identified targets uh, in partnership, I suppose, with the other key stakeholders. Um, and I've got the statistic, I'm happy to share it. I don't know if you want me to go through it. In well, maybe not just now, but maybe you could yeah, list it, because yeah. we've got a list of, I think, about eight things that you've achieved in these nine, five years. Yeah, there's nine, nine sorry, objectives. Right. Uh, right. Innovation Centre, just to correct the dates, the Innovation Centre was launched October 2014 uh -huh. for a five-year period, so okay. October 14 to... Right, so if you could maybe send us afterwards the c how the, the, the actual compares with the targets, and then I suppose then following on from that in phase... Two is that so? That's two thousand nineteen to twenty three. Is that that will officially start first of June two thousand nineteen? Yeah. Okay. And again, there's some figures mentioned there. Can you can you tell us how these targets were set or who set them? Was that yourselves or did wider industry get involved? Or? Uh, yes. So two uh, or three kind of key parts to that. Those figures are driven by um, feedback that came back from an open consultation with industry. Um, they are shaped by our industry led board, and they reflect the wider. Um, publications and, and you know, documents that have come out from a number of different parts of industry in terms of priority areas, focus areas, uh, opportunities for growth and change, uh, including Construction Scotland strategy, but also things like the Farmer Review, Construction 2025, uh, the Industrial Strategy, the, the um, Transforming Construction Programme has very clear specific areas that it sees as opportunities. So uh, the Phase two program um, around driving digital transformation, culture change, building sustainably, and uh, adopting greater industrialisation are all driven from uh, those wide industry markers and drivers, I guess, that, that sit in that broader context. Right. So, do, do you think um, then there's broad agreement that these are, you know, the correct targets? For example, 100 academic to business collaborations is that a reasonable um, target? Yes, I think so. Given we have 14 uh, university partners, um, the figures on the um, on the engagement historically have been uh, of that kind of nature. So we're keen to grow it, but we're conscious that the model has to evolve and develop. So we are looking at phase two that will not be uh, entirely focused on universities, which has been the case with phase one. We'll have greater engagement with colleges, which has not been something we've ever been um, funded to support directly, albeit we have you know, done quite a lot around colleges because industry has demanded it. Um, and I think that's only natural with the evolution of a, a, a programme uh, into a second phase as it looks at those areas of success, looks at those areas where industry is um, you know, keen to take forward greater opportunity uh, and respond you know, positively to that. So you know, the setting of those targets has been done with, you know, uh, as I mentioned, the, the consultation with industry gave us good feedback on phase one. The industry-led board gives us good direction around where it sees the, the opportunities uh, and our stakeholder partners uh, are, are 
um, supportive and, and, and the mix, I suppose, in terms of how we set targets that will allow us to stretch what we're doing, um, but also also meet the wider objectives of. You know, I mean, when, when we launched this, this in, inquiry, we, we you know we always had to take evidence, and I think I think it'd be fair to say we got a mixture. I mean, some of it was very positive. Uh, said that the CSIC has been a source of extremely positive support, helped us on projects, um, we, um, encourage en engagement with CSIC has transformed our approach. So that's very positive. Uh, we also did have some negative stuff. Um, there was little usable input, somebody said. The wider industry has no insight as to what has actually it has actually achieved. I mean, is there an, an issue that what's going on inside the Innovation Centre, the wider industry maybe doesn't get or understand? Uh, I think in some respects it's inevitable in an industry of 45,000 businesses with over 230,000 uh, employees that an organisation with 11 outward-facing staff is going to have a challenge engaging with all of it. Um, if, if that's an unreasonable assumption, then, um, then I would welcome ideas as to how we do that, using all the digital channels that we use, social media platforms, engagement events, um, activity across Scotland. Um, the, the reality is, you know, we're a programme that has, a, you know, to fund projects and to run the centre that has a £1.5 million a year as a budget. So within that, we have to, you know, identify the areas where we can make greatest impact. Um, we have over 6,500 Individuals that we contact with, that we engage with regularly on our uh, on our database, so that they get kept up to date, and that is growing at a, a, a significant rate month on month. So I think the future looks positive. But yes, there's always areas where we can engage more broadly. But that's where uh, part of you don't mind me using the opportunity put the call out to the um, trade professional federation bodies within within Scotland who, uh, if they don't know about us, should know about us, and we would. We welcome the opportunity to engage with them because by going to them, we can reach their members much more easily. I, I mean, I think some of my colleagues will explore some of this further, but I, I'd just be interested in a comment from Mr. Caldwell, Professor Hairstens, about um, how how does the wider sector see the innovation centre? Do you think there's a lack of it, knowledge about it, or I, I can, on, can only speak for ourselves, but yep. we've, we've engaged quite heavily with. Uh, I think um, I think we we have a timber engineering part to our business which has been looking at both uh, the members here today uh, and working with them uh, collab collaboratively um, Claire could probably answer that in more detail unfortunately but um, certainly I'm I'm well aware of the centre and do receive communication from them even through the normal industry media newsletters and so on that you, you get there's always a little article on it and what they're doing and that kind of thing so from our perspective, there's uh, certainly an, an awareness of what's been going on. Yeah, I think the organisations we are working with um, are quite innovative organisations, so they have a, a knowledge of the Construction Scotland Innovation Centre, um, perhaps a scope for a wider reach into the, into prof the professions, the structural engineers, etc. Uh, but certainly the organisations that, that we work with that are looking to drive innovation have a, a good knowledge of the Innovation Centre and what it's doing, and indeed, uh, are in, uh, to my knowledge, at least engaging with it on, on research projects. Thank you. I'll leave it to that just now. Can I maybe just add one last Thank point? You. If that's all right. Sorry, just I think the I think Robert's point there on you know it's no surprise we engage with businesses that are looking to innovate, uh, and it's probably no surprise, albeit uh, a much tougher task. It's what we are keen to do uh, is uh, not have as much awareness across businesses that perhaps don't. So I think that has to be borne in mind in some respects. Jackie Bailey. Just on that point, I think we absolutely get that, but some of the criticism hasn't come from you know, the admittedly 45,000 businesses that are out there. It's come from Construction Scotland, which you helpfully established as the separate um, industry leadership group, and it's beyond awareness. So I wonder whether I could just test some of their criticisms with the panel um, and see if you, you consider them valid. So Construction Scotland has told us that due to the way in... in it, it, the way the Construction Innovation Centre has been both funded and governed, it hasn't been able to support the more strategic policy and transformational research needs of overall industry. Now, is that a fair assessment? 
I might as well start with Stephen Good. Yeah. Um, this will be my period. Uh, on the issue of governance, uh, firstly, um, as I touched on earlier, the governance model was endorsed by Construction Scotland when the bid was put in. The governance model hasn't changed. Um, over the piece, albeit members of the Governance Board have changed. So. The, the question is, you, you can put something in at the beginning, but if it's not working, has that been highlighted and is it going to change? Um, I think you have to... Uh, I think it's important to understand whether it's not working from one other organisation's perspective, perhaps, okay. or whether it's not working um, from the industry perspective. And the evidence I think that we can turn to is that the, the governance model is um, is consistent with the Innovation Centre programme governance model. Um, it is industry leaders that lead our industry-led governance board. So from that point of view, it's clear, and particularly given we have quite a wide range of industry leaders, including of the calibre of Mark Farmer, for example, who um, has uh, has been involved in um, you know, UK-wide and international leadership around the industry. I think that's important. Um, the question, I suppose, for me is one of uh, one of organisations' ability to collaborate, as opposed to necessarily changing governance models and the uh, the ambition from the Innovation Centre Governance Board uh, and op executive team has always been to collaborate with every organisation. Uh, that's how this industry will change, is ultimately by doing things constructively together, not by um, perhaps feeling the need to control things differently. Um, on the issue of uh, finance and funding um, of projects, uh, the model, the Innovation Centre uh, model, the Innovation Centre programme model, was around using the academic expertise that exists in Scotland, which is world class, to drive change within uh, whichever industry uh, the, the Innovation Centre is focused on. Um, that model requires industry to have skin in the game. It requires industry to uh, lead those projects. We don't support projects that doesn't have industry leadership. Um, the projects, uh, yes, could be criticised for being um, too you know, business focused as opposed to a broader sector leadership group focused, but I would refer back to the point about SMEs uh, made earlier, you know, if we are engaging with um, the SMEs who, you know, broadly you could argue are perhaps not recognised as the industry leaders um, in, in the kind of larger leadership sort of sense, um, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't support SME businesses that are trying to innovate. So the model is, um, I think, successful. The issue uh, is perhaps more around willingness to engage and collaborate and you know, since the publication of the Construction Scotland strategy, uh, Construction Scotland are aware of our offer uh, to engage directly with each of the working group chairs to take forward what we do have within our gift and appreciate that the model is, um, is um, some would describe it as you know, not perfect in so much that the tool we have in our toolbox is funding to support industry to draw on academic expertise. We recognise in construction that that's not the only support that industry needs, but industry has to take um, responsibility, I suppose, for accessing the other support that is already there. Scotland is blessed with a, a hugely, um, a hugely um, a deep innovation support landscape. Um, it's often not easy to navigate, and that's one of our jobs for the construction industry is to try and declutter um, the support that's available from others, like Interface and Scottish Enterprise, Highlands, Islands Enterprise, other organisations um, for this sector, this industry. Um, so the support to deliver some of the strategic stuff is there. We can um, uh, coordinate or, or facilitate some of that for Construction Scotland, but if the criticism is we can't fund all the things they want to do on our own, that's partly because the model um, isn't there to do it, and in some respects shouldn't be if these other things exist. We don't have any ambition to duplicate other things that are already there. Okay. Professor? Um, in terms of the projects that, that we've engaged with, the Innovation Centre, and we have engaged with projects of value uh, circa £300,000 over the first five years, they have largely been uh, related to an in a lead industry partner. Um, so correspondingly, the, the results and the findings of that uh, are fed to that industry partner. Um, or, you know, if there's any commercial sensitivities or anything around the work, it can often be difficult for us to, to publish that work, especially it's a gold standard peer review publication, which is obviously the academic endeavour to get you know, um, our work out there. Uh, that's often not necessarily viewed by industry um, as being critical to what they want. Ultimately, they want their problem solved, not necessarily for the work to be, to be published, but from an academic standpoint, that's how we want to international, internationalise our findings and, and, and get outreach. Um, so I would say that there's, there's certainly scope to try and um, to improve upon that. 
and, and for hopefully for industry to understand the, the value in, in doing so, um, because obviously it raises the bar in terms of what we're doing and achieving here on, on that international platform. Um, I would say that one of the, the projects that, that has been very successful, which Robertson's a part of as well, is, is the Offsite Solutions Scotland, which is a collaborative framework of, of uh, lead offsite providers in, in Scotland. Um, that was originally brought together. It was a, at the very inception of the Innovation Centre, indeed. It was originally uh, UK Commission for Employment and Skills funded, which is now part of, of BIS, as I understand. Um, but that, that project <coughs> moved forward further under the Innovation Centre with dedicated research as, assistance support. Um, and, and Offsite Solutions Scotland is now well formed as a cooperative with its own legal and financial entity, uh, with a view to scaling offsite construction in in Scotland with Innovation Centre, Scottish Enterprise and uh, academic support primarily coming from Ed Edinburgh and Napier as a lead academic institution on that basis. So I think more of those types of frameworks and collaborations would be absolutely key uh, through either uh, well-connected um, industries who could be in a sense viewed as competitors but actually coming together as a, as a collaboration makes a lot of sense um, and also how that can permeate further through the supply chain both up and down. I think some of my colleagues will explore that further with you, but can I come back to your original point? Because that was another criticism made by Construction Scotland um, in that they highlight a problem being the very commercial nature of some of the projects means that the learning from them can't initially at least be, be shared um, amongst others, yet the Innovation Centre tell us that the majority of learning is shared and there is a culture of open IP. The two don't really sit entirely comfortably with each other. Would that be fair? But I think that's, there's always a sense of that. We, because it's not just with Innovation Centre, but we you know, do things like knowledge transfer partnerships through Innovate UK. There's other funding mechanisms, either through Scottish Enterprise, etc. cetera. In this, if we're doing uh, research and innovation work for an industry partner, there's inevitably going to be commercial sensitivities and a necessity for them to trust what we are doing. Um, I think we are well well skilled indeed um, to publish that work without eroding the commercial sensitivities around it. Um, certainly we've got a track record of, of doing so. So I think there's a, a necessity for um, for industry almost to see the the, the value in, in publishing and in journal publishing and, uh, and creating academic outputs from work because it's not always fully apparent to them. Um, but it means that it's, it's peer reviewed the methodology is, is demonstrated to be robust and correspondingly the findings have resonance and, and impact. And that's, that's what's absolutely key for us as an academic institution is, is creating impact uh, and legacy from, a, from our research and, and, and building a body of work which can inform future innovation as well. Okay. Um, can I ask Alan Coldwell, are the Robertson Group a member of Construction Scotland? Yeah, uh, I believe we are. Okay. Um, I'm not. I'm not it, sure. Sorry, it's not mine. Okay. Theory. I don't know whether you could shed any light on on what appears to be going on because um, there's a dissonance between what the construction industry group tell us um, in Construction Scotland and what we're being told by the Innovation Centre. And I'm, I absolutely get the potential of the collaboration is one that would be excellent, but it's not happening. And I'm just wondering why. Can you shed any light on this? Probably not. I'm sorry. Ah, um, okay. But a, a couple of observations, perhaps, is that I, th I believe Construction Scotland has quite a wide ranging membership from companies like ourselves down to small uh, contractors and, and covers most. And that, that's the intention of it. Um, so it's quite difficult for them to represent everyone in the same way to the same extent, I suspect. So I'm not sure where the the author of that response, but... It, it they had the foresight to actually want the development yes, of the no, Innovation Centre no, absolutely. Okay, yeah. and agreed governance models at the beginning. So something's happened along the way, and mm -hmm. I'm just trying to understand what that is. I could certainly take that back and, that would and be very and helpful look into to that. Get yeah. that view. Yeah. Stephen probably has a view. <laughs> well, I mean, there's different leadership within the industry leadership group uh, now who m may have different views in terms of what they see as the priorities from when the Innovation Centre was conceived um, back in 2014. Um, I think on the, uh, you know, the, the sense in creating a united, you know, 
website. I appreciate that's just one dimension of how we engage with the industry. But the sense in creating a united website with common branding and common, you know, approach to messaging, uh, I think, remains sound uh, for an industry leadership group and the innovation centre for that industry to work hand in glove. Uh, there's no, there's no bad vision behind that. Um, operationally, some may feel that's, you know, less of a priority. Um, but I'll go back to the fact that we have a common website with Construction Scotland. Um, if uh, members want to, members here or members of Construction Scotland want to um, revisit that website um, in the future and uh, explore the case studies that exist there um, for the completed projects that have been undertaken, the dissemination events that we the, that we hold as recently as two weeks ago, uh, Building Better Homes uh, event was attended by 60 industry um, members to hear about four projects that have completed the dissemination from academic and industry partners, um, you know, answers that question. You know, we don't need to take my word for it. They were all there, and I'm happy to provide you. GDPR allows me with the names of who attended, but um, and and you know, in a wider sense, our web portal allows directly allows anybody that accesses it, Construction Scotland members or others, um, to connect into all the other, as far as we're aware, all the other. Um, national funded programmes in Scotland and across the UK that are supporting innovation within the construction industry, tying into the catapult centres across the U UK, tying into um, CONFAIR, which is a, a web portal that uses AI to scan uh, academic research papers on everything. Um, to be fair, it's not um, the richest database for construction related research, but that perhaps points to whether there is the you know the breadth of rich research into construction that the industry perhaps could commission if it wanted to uh, do that. So um, there are plenty of vehicles and mechanisms accessible through a website that's currently shared between Construction Scotland and the Innovation Centre um, that provides answers to all these things that perhaps uh, the, the writers of the comments might want to refresh their memory around. I'm sure they're listening with rapt attention. Thank you, convener. Willie Coffey. If I could um, briefly take you back to the digital agenda, please. There's two lovely comments in the papers that we have in front of us. One, I think it's from yourself, Stephen, that says the construction industry is on the verge of a digital and manufacturing revolution. And there's another comment here that says the construction industry has remained in the Stone Age. Uh, I suspect that the truth is somewhere in between, but I'd like to explore with you which side of that line you think we're actually on and uh, where, where we might be going in terms of digital skills within the industry. Sure. appreciate I've been hogging the mic, perhaps. But somebody else <laughs> want to go first? Or, <laughs> or you want me to well, answer? You said it. So I'll say it first. Okay. <laughs> uh, I don't think the two are incompatible. I think industry is on the verge of a digital and manufacturing revolution and I think the industry uh, is in a place where it's got a lot to do to catch up. Um, the statistics that sit behind that, um, McKinsey Global, who provide a lot of statistics on a lot of industries, most recent uh, evidence for, the uh, for all industries or 20-odd industries across the world in terms of their level of digitalisation placed construction second from bottom, just above hunting and fishing. Uh, so I think that um, probably identifies where we are currently, but in some respects, Certainly from our point of view, that creates a huge opportunity because um, the 19 or 20 odd industries that sit above us who have embraced digital transformation, Robert touched on Industry 4.0 earlier, um, that perhaps presents an opportunity for industry not to have to reinvent the wheel. Um, it comes back to that point of collaboration. It's not just about industry talking to more uh, construction industry folk about how to um, drive change. It's actually about reaching out into other industries. How have they embraced change? How have they adopted digital technologies? Um, are all huge opportunities for the construction industry. And I think it's important to note that this construction uh, sector, industry in, in the UK and globally, is actually already adopting a huge amount of digital technologies, whether that's moving from paper-based drawings on site to iPads to, you know, level two BIM and uh, build information modeling and beyond or advanced, you know, off-site semi-automated solutions. Um, augmented virtual reality offers huge potential. So I think the um, I think the future looks incredibly positive for those businesses that want to embrace that change. For those that don't, the harsh reality is organizations like Facebook and Amazon and, and um, Google and Airbnb are investing in prefabricated manufacturing companies because they see opportunities in this industry. Uh, and our job, in some respects, I guess, is to 
uh, it sounds like a daft expression, but to try and help this industry disrupt itself before it gets disrupted um, by others. Uh, so, yes, we're hugely positive about the opportunities that technology um, presents for this industry. Industry has to embrace those opportunities, and the other comment perhaps suggests that that observation is some other parts might not. Do you think digital skills are coming in at the right level, let's say at graduate entry level? Is industry aware of its growing reliance in the whole digital transformation agenda? Do you think, or, or, from what you're saying, I don't think it is at the moment, so does more work need to be done at that gradual entry level from the bottom up to get the software development and software awareness skills in the industry? I mean, a lot of what we have spoken about today and probably will continue to talk about comes back to me to culture and leadership. So if industry develops the right leadership skills and embraces the right culture, it can coordinate, because it's for the industry's benefit, it can coordinate the, um, the activity it wants to see happen and will, by its nature, I suspect, because it's impacted all of us, embrace digital technologies as and when those enabling technologies offer benefits for those businesses. So a business is not just going to adopt AR, VR technology because you know, an innovation centre told them it should. Um, it'll do it if it can recognise some um, some benefit ultimately. Innovation for us is about change that delivers some degree of value and it's about capturing that value it is absolutely key. So where the skills and the training then sits around that will be quite broad. Um, it will be at all different levels. It will be at leadership levels. It will be at apprenticeship levels. It will be this industry engaging at you know, primary school level in some respects to make it an industry of uh, of choice as opposed to perhaps sometimes perceived as an industry of last resort. So um, the, the change I think is coming, it's how industry organises itself culturally in, in a leadership sense to take full advantage of that. Um, you know, I'll maybe touch on what some individual businesses are doing around that, but th th this change is coming. Um, there's, always a, there's always a challenge that um, uh, some businesses will lead that charge, and I think the, the obvious observation, I guess, is that um, as an innovation centre, we will work with innovative businesses, so they will embrace these changes, they will embrace uh, the, the, the new technologies. But at a wider mainstream level, the industry, given it's so big, wide, fragmented, um, will, will have some catching up to do, as will the deliverers of the skills support around that. Um, so it's, it's not a linear process, but there's a lot of, uh, a lot of moving parts. You were, you were saying uh, it's mostly SMEs, of course, so is it the case that a lot of MS SMEs, they, they don't understand the technology and they can't afford it anyway, so they're just not going to make that step change? What enables them to make the step change? Is it organisations like yourself? Or how do we enable them to make the step change? Uh, Alan touched on it earlier, there, there's always a risk in doing something different. There's a nervousness absolutely around technology. We've probably all experienced it when we started you know, using smartphones different ways. So there's always a, a, a you know, human nature, I suppose, is broadly risk averse. So when change comes, um, yeah, there'll be those that adopt early because they see the opportunity and think they've got the skills to take that opportunity forward and there'll be those that would prefer to wait and be second, third, fourth in line. Um, I think uh, I think the businesses that embrace, I mean, from an SME point of view, we have worked with some um, you know, micro SME businesses who are right in the middle of the technology space. So they actually um, don't see themselves bizarrely as a construction business, they see themselves perhaps as a technology business working in the construction industry. Uh, and that's an interesting uh, twist to put on where some of the SMEs perhaps see their model in the future, because that is often, a, a, they, are, um, they kind of wake up a bit more global perhaps. Often construction can be criticised for being a bit parochial. Um, whereas some of the you know the businesses that embrace technology and innovation and change don't see Scotland as their only market. And I think that's hugely interesting for an industry that doesn't export an awful lot. Professor Hairston, have we got the right digital skills in the industry? Are we, are we doing it correctly or do we need to do more to get that in there? That's, yeah, that's a good question, isn't it? Um, I think one of the things probably to touch upon here is that as we move forward, the more interdisciplinary and multidisciplinary nature of it. Um, because obviously, if we think historically about construction and the professions, they are quite siloed. Um, but moving forward into things like building information model and the whole purpose of that is to create a more collaborative approach, a more collaborative workflow and, and, uh, and create transparency uh, around the products and the systems. Um, the sector is fragmented, the supply chain uh, can, can be uh, difficult to synthesise and correspondingly trying to build that into digital models uh, can be difficult. Um, however, as you move to a more industrialised, factory-based approach, then fundamentally that should 
that should become easier. Um, manufacturing organisations have enterprise resource planning systems. They have, uh, and, and you know, ideally internal sort of digital frameworks. Um, you know that that cut across the, the, the relevant departments. So fundamentally, it, it should lend itself to a more digitised approach as, as we move forward, and we move forward to a more manufacturing way of creating the, the built environment. Um, in terms of the SMEs, I mean, a lot of the, the, the companies that we've worked on with the, the SME uh, organisations, come back to Stephen's point indeed about these organisations obviously have uh, quite strong leadership. Uh, and I have a particular culture to them, an innovative culture. So often they're, they're at the forefront for, for a particular reason, whether it's uh, digitisation or capturing a, uh, of information for, to, to demonstrate the, the environmental credentials of their product, or whether that's uh, to create virtual reality, augmented reality um, for you know, the augmented worker, or to, to demonstrate from a marketing perspective, perspective the, sort of, uh, the, the value of the product or the, the the consumer's understanding of the product, so you can get an early design freeze, uh, which is key for, for a, a manufactured approach. Um, some of these organisations have been at the forefront of trying to drive that, that digital agenda, but we are seeing more of it within, within the sector. Um, and a large part, I think, you know, productivity is, is, is key to this. And I would say um, what was being asked earlier on is Scotland's not alone in many of these challenges. Um, productivity internationally in construction is poor, uh, stagnating at best. But there's organisations, you know, if you look at the US, Katera is a tech, uh, was, was a, the CEO of that organisation was uh, from a tech background uh, and the aspirations for it was to defragment the construction sector to create, uh, you know, a more environmentally uh, better performing product uh, with a, a productivity driven agenda. Um, and now, you know, that tech startup, you know, has a three billion valuation after four years. So does, you know, Stephen, you know, Google, uh, Airbnb, these organisations are looking at it and they're looking at it from a different perspective. And those that aren't will get left behind fundamentally. And there will be things that will disrupt the sector. Um, and thinking about the product both as a physical and digital asset and the information that can be collated from that digital asset through um, through the user's engagement with it. Um, that then becomes a data, data management uh, and, and how you capture that data and how you utilise it and how you monetise it effectively. So there's, there's absolutely changes afoot. So the organisations that aren't looking at it will get left behind. And we have to think, uh, we have to think laterally about the skills and knowledge and individuals that, that have to move into that sector and how we will, how we will deliver that future workforce, because it will be different. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. To move on to Dean Lockhart, but just before that, I think Jamie Hilko Johnson had a supplementary. Yeah, thanks very much, convener. Good morning. Um, one of the things that we've been talking about here is is the role of universities and colleges, and I'm wondering whether, before that, schools could play a, a greater role uh, within that. In last week was obviously Apprenticeships Week, and colleagues, uh, I think, visited apprentices across the country. One of the uh, groups that I met talked about um, the potential for a, constru a dedicated to construction foundation apprenticeship, and I was wondering whether that getting that involvement uh, earlier into schools could be something that would be of interest, and also might be an opportunity to integrate some of the, the digital skills um, that um, you've been talking about. Yes, um, I think STEM, uh, you know, we, we all want to encourage STEM and, uh, and for me, the, the built environment and, and having school kids in, uh, and involved, um, you know, there's a great uh, product which I'm sure the individuals here are aware of, you know, design engine and construct a uh, class of your own, um, the, the model that, that they've created and, and going into schools and using the digital environment um, uh, and encouraging school kids to, you know, to, to design a class of your own by its very name. But that, that doesn't have to be restricted even to, the, to their, their, their school. It could be, it could literally be on local local sites, um, vacant and derelict land sites, which we have a, a challenge with in, in Scotland, um, a member of that, that task force. But um, we can be encouraging skids, kids rather to, to think of uh, what can be done to deliver the future built environment, have them active engage. And what's really neat about it is the different the, the sort of STEM orientated skills that they would pick up through that process. Uh, and, you know, as we know, 
uh, younger generation are very digitally aware, so their engagement with that type of process uh, is, is, you know, is a lot, you know, can be a lot easier uh, for them as such. Uh, and the tools and technology that are available to facilitate that, as particularly if we can have um, industry engagement or what we've tried to encourage, even um, uh, student ment mentorship. So having uh, students um, from the university go in and, and facilitate that, that learning, because often the, the school the school teachers don't necessarily have the knowledge and the background to deliver it, but we can create a sort of mentorship model to, to, to encourage it. But I think absolutely uh, it, it's, it's fundamental and it can be a tool for for uh, further learning. Whether that whether that individual goes into a career in construction or delivery of the built environment or not, the education that it can provide them, the understanding the problem solving, etc., can provide a much wider educational basis. I would, yeah, I mean, I would add, uh, albeit it hasn't been an area where we have had capacity within our existing model to reach uh, an awful lot in the schools. We have hosted um, probably now several thousand school children to the Innovation Centre to expose them, I suppose, to the art of the possible. What could this industry look like? What sort of technologies could this industry use? How do they, you know, relate to your, you know, my kids are 10 and 12 and are significantly more digitally, digitally savvy than I am. Uh, and in some respects, they are the future of this industry. Uh, so this industry has to be appealing to them. So this industry has a responsibility to engage with um, school children, uh, young people at all ages uh, to paint an appropriate picture of what this industry is. If the perception is that this industry is pushing a wheelbarrow around a muddy building site, then that will, you know, that will disengage a lot of children who see their future being in, you know, digital potentially. Uh, Data Lab, one of the other innovation centres, uh, Chief Exec and I often have a, uh, a an ongoing conversation around the talent war, I guess, and how do we make sure that you know, children that do want to be data scientists recognise that the construction industry in the future is going to be an area where that is a really valuable, um, a really valuable role. As as, you know, um, as as robot operators or um, people who you know coordinate BIM models and, and it's kind of Minecraft for grown-ups in some respects. So um, there are huge opportunities. The industry is um, is uh, you know that going back to Mark Farmer's review of the labour model. You know that was one of his key observations: is if you want to engage the future talent of this industry to create the, the skills that we need in the future, you've got to engage with um, children that are at primary school just now whose you know, parents, school teachers, guidance teachers don't know what this industry is going to be. Um, and uh, you know, we, we'll do what we can around that, but equally we have to be mindful that for every you know bus of school kids that comes through the factory, that may slow down project activity we're doing with businesses. So there's an opportunity to widen that remit potentially, um, but, uh, but there's, there's a you know, it's incumbent on this industry to make sure that that pipeline of talent for the future is engaged, wants to work in this amazing industry, which has so many different diverse opportunities, and it doesn't just attract talent on the basis of whether your you know, mum or dad was a joiner. So do you think that could also improve, perhaps, uh, that that perception could improve the number of uh, women taking on uh, apprenticeships? Absolutely. Which is obviously very low. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, I think it's 11% of the industry is mm. female. Um, so the industry has work to do to get you know, it's evidence you know, coming out of all areas telling you that better balance delivers better businesses, better educational institutes. Um, we, we have to, as an industry, um, make sure that we are not disengaging 50% you know, of the population um, because that talent needs to work in this industry. Um, Robert touched on uh, the Class of Your Own initiative and the DEC programme and Alison Watson that runs that uh, again joined our board because she saw huge value uh, in engaging around the opportunities that businesses like Robertson Group who engage with that programme um, see in terms of developing that pipeline, developing that talent um, by using the digital skills that industry is using today. Um, almost, uh, you know, there's a, there's a kind of we, we were involved with the colleges around this future equipped pro, uh, pilot project fairly recently, and a big part of that was about training the trainers because if those that are teaching, you know, school children or, or college lecturers or whatnot, uh, don't know about what the industry is going to look like in the future, it's very difficult to inspire children about what it's going to be like. So part of our role is to is to you know do that kind of educate the educators piece, uh, and the education part we do is to bring in the expertise from universities, engage them in the technologies that businesses are already using, and say this is what the future looks like. So. Um, so a lot, a lot to do around that. I think the outreach, um, you know, using things like CITB's Go Construct 
uh, model as a kind of hub, as a, as a linchpin for it, as opposed to what often happens. And again, it's understandable in an industry that's so broad and fragmented. But if, you know, Construction Scotland, for an, uh, an example, if its key role is to unite the industry, one of the greatest opportunities would be for it to be able to have programmes that, that you know, are coordinated and all sing from a, a common kind of place around where the industry is going, what the opportunities are, and how you see kind of roots into that. Thank you. We'll move on to Dean Lockhart, who may take up that theme. Uh, thank you, convener. Yes, to continue to explore the future of the sector, I'd like to hear from the panel about your views uh, about future growth, uh, where the future growth of the sector might come from, and where the key areas of opportunity lie ahead, perhaps looking at the, f the next five to ten years. Where would you see the key areas of growth in the sector coming from? My particular area and focus um, is around off-site industrialised construction, as you can probably tell, um, which obviously embraces uh, digitisation. Um, I think Scotland uh, is exceptionally well positioned to be capitalising on that and thinking of it right the way through the supply chain to the forest floor. Um, we have worked extensively with uh, the organisations in Offsite Solutions Scotland, which are largely uh, timber-based off-site manufacturers. We also work closely with the, the Forestry Commission and the industry leadership group there, uh, and the corresponding the, the sort of supply chain from forest floor all the way through to end product. Um, and there's real opportunities in there uh, to create, um, because timber is essentially a clean tech solution for the built environment. Um, and there's opportunity to evolve products, processes, um, engineered timber products and systems, um, enhanced panelised systems, uh, what can be manufactured in timber off-site facilities such as uh, those at Robertson's and CCG in Glasgow, Macar Construction, Carbon Dynamic, all the way up to Norscott and, and Caithness. Um, taking a fabric first approach, delivering affordable housing, uh, which is sustainable and sequestrate carbon, which therefore uh, helps us in terms of our, the climate agenda. Um, it also helps um, the social and economic impact, you know, from a, a, even a startup position in the creation of, of new products and systems and the new skills for the delivery of, of that of that built environment, uh, and ultimately, if, if it's renewable energy sources which are then powering those houses, then you know it's a win-win scenario because we're conserving energy through the, the fabric performance, sequestrating carbon within it, and use and the utilisation of renewable energy to, to ultimately power that infrastructure. So I think we can be a trailblazer on that front with the with the right if the light the, the correct levers are, are pulled, uh, and we look to to synthesise that that supply chain as much as possible and create a digital thread through throughout it, which takes you right back to the to the forest floor. Mr. Caldwell. Yeah. Um, I wish I had that crystal ball, and we'd be in a great place to to look ahead. I'd, I'd certainly the. The digital side of things is going to be huge. Um, we embraced it properly probably about five years ago and have set up a team and, and roll out training across our business. I think the idea, the previous question about going into schools is a great one. We engage with thousands and thousands of school children every year on not just schools projects, but you know any other projects to try and promote the industry and so on. And to add that uh, digital side of things would be great from the future coming through. Um, the, the benefits to really getting involved with uh, building information modelling uh, is obvious to us now, and we, we're already realising some of those benefits in terms of building the building twice, you build it once in the computer, you sort out as many problems as you can, you won't ever sort out all of them, and it makes your job once you're on site, so your deliverability is more credible, it's more consistent, and you're meeting budgets and time scales consistently on, on all jobs. So we've seen the benefits from that side. We've seen the benefits from client engagement side to, you know, the augmented reality to let them walk through their building whilst the previous building is still on the site. They can see what the new building is going to look like. And actually, you, the more you can develop that and get a, a design locked in earlier, it allows you to build it better and be more consistent. I don't see different sectors uh, developing particularly. That's just a personal opinion. Um, I think it's improving what we do in the sectors that are there. Renewables certainly need to become more 
of, um, uh, well, that's just what we do, rather than, well, let's see if we can't fit some renewables into this building. It, it should be there already, and we should be doing that as an industry. Um, it just makes sense all around. The cost of energy now is such, and the, you know we, we want it to be reliable uh, sources as well. Um, I think in terms of sustain sustainable delivery, it's got to be uh, continue to be emphasised. It has been over the years, um, each year more so, but we've got to be aware of that and look at that and try and find newer, better ways to make sure we're developing a sustainable industry, not just from a green perspective, but that's really important, but from a, you know, a sustainable business perspective. We need to be here in 10 years um, to make sure we can deliver on these things. And from the FM side, if we develop the digital side of things properly, running buildings become so much easier. Everything's there. You know, we you mentioned already, we already use iPads on site. It's perhaps not the normal image that you see, but our project managers all have iPads, all go around looking at drawings, checking what's being built, is what's done, and anything that's not gets recorded and touch of a button, it's back. And so you're looking at that continuous improvement thing all the time, and the digitization of the industry is helping that significantly. Um, yeah, I mean, I think back to one of the previous questions around you know, why are our phase two priorities in certain spaces? They sit around culture change, uh, and that's wide and broad, so perhaps not a direct answer. But the other three areas around digital transformation, uh, accelerating industrialisation, so the manufacturing side of things that Robert touched on, uh, and building sustainably, um, particularly with the backdrop of you know the the um, awareness that you know I touched on earlier, you know. Uh, young people's awareness of digital, but equally uh, in the last couple of months, young people's awareness of the environment and, and the potential challenges uh, that we face and the construction industry is a huge contributor to some of the problems in terms of waste, in terms of CO2 production. So I think big opportunities um, for you know industry in Scotland, you know, Scotland as a, as a nation, is, as Robert used the term, trailblazing you know, solutions that pull together a lot of these things into a holistic kind of offering. So using the best digital enabling technologies to deliver the best, you know, most efficiently manufactured products, wherever they may be, whether it is on site or in a, in a factory environment somewhere else, um, and to you know, very demanding uh, energy targets, um, because that, in some respects, is our responsibility as an industry to make sure that we are not contributing to the problem. So those areas, you know, they, they align, um, as it happens, particularly well with um, the Transform and Construction Programme, the industrial strategy approach around digital manufacturing and, and energy, and that's about how we design buildings better, how we manufacture buildings better, and how we then operate and run buildings better. So those are areas, I think, where, again, as Robert touched on, Scotland has already got some you know, world-class leading expertise around the manufacturing and the digital side of things. Um, the market opportunity in the rest of the UK alone is huge, uh, as everybody else is looking for smarter, you know, better, faster, cheaper solutions. I think Scotland has huge opportunity around that, and I would agree with Alan. I don't think it's in any one particular sector, uh, although I do think there is a huge opportunity um, in the kind of retrofit market. A lot of what we talk about tends to be how do we build new things better, but actually how do we tackle the elephant in the room, which is the existing stock, of which there's a lot, and the technical challenges are often a little tougher. Uh, how do you take you know, existing buildings on that same sort of journey to make sure that contribution is, uh, is well made as well? I think are where there's big major opportunities for, um, for the industry. Thank you, Rob. Now to Angela Constance, as we're running out of time. So, Angela Constance. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, Good morning to the panel. Looking to the future, uh, I wondered if people are concerned uh, about Brexit and whether, just for the record, you could summarise what you see as the main challenges for the sector, maybe your top two or three, um, and that can obviously be beyond um, innovation and matters we've discussed thus far. And also, given that the Scottish Government economic strategy, uh, one of its four priorities is innovation, along with investment, inclusive growth, internationalisation, um, what more could government at all levels uh, and across the public sector do to support the construction sector better? And I'll start with Mr Good, if that's OK. Sure. Yes. Um, Brexit. Um, I suppose... In some respects, I would view Brexit as being an additional spur for this industry to reform. You know, before Brexit kind of came along as a potential um, scenario, the industry 
you know, Farmer Review and others have cited it and there's a need to change. Uh, the challenges that Brexit will bring, whether it's uh, about confidence in terms of investment, uh, whether it's about supply of materials and, and goods and services, whether it's about uh, people and the availability of you know, skilled labour, um, are all challenges that not just this industry is going to face. But I don't think, um, I don't think, you know, I think this industry has got a reform, you know, agenda in front of it, despite Brexit in some respects. Um, the wider question around um, the wider question around, sorry, lost <laughs> my train of thought. Top, the top challenges, top challenges the yes, um, and the lever, uh, the lever, I suppose, for government. I, I think you know, coming back to uh, points in our uh, our feedback uh, in terms of the written evidence, earlier discussions today, it, government and its agencies that buy from the construction industry have huge levers. I appreciate that there are procurement challenges sometimes around how to do that um, effectively, but in some respects, the, the, the policy is already there for public sector clients and others to buy things from this industry in such a way that it drives investment in skills and innovation and technology. Um, but sometimes it chooses not to do it, would be my kind of observation. Uh, so if you know, government can do anything, it would be to encourage those agencies and organisations that already have the potential levers within their you know, control in terms of policy to use them as effectively as they can uh, to help the industry that is willing, as you've heard today, to invest in technology and, and skills and change, but is, you know, has a degree of risk to that. So you know, the Infrastructure uh, Commission, for example, setting you know, visionary long-term kind of objectives and investment plans, uh, uh, you know, one very quick kind of example of what sums up for me is engaging with um, a particular business who is hugely engaged in the innovation journey. It always makes uh, th three observations to us. As an industry, we don't really want grants. We don't really want loans. What we want is contracts, and those contracts to be you know, long enough and certain enough into the future uh, that we can make our own investment decisions around what's best for our business, around skills and technology and, and innovation. Um, and that is where I think those levers that government can pull can help create that longer term, whether it's around you know, 50,000 homes or whether it's around infrastructure in a, in a wider uh, kind of non-domestic sense. There are huge opportunities that are already there within some of the levers. They just need pulled probably in the right, the right way. And, and that would be, I suppose, my ask, I suppose, as if, um, if those agencies that, that have those opportunities uh, at their disposal could use them as effectively as they see fit to help this industry move to the footing that we all kind of want to see it move to. Um, none of it should be hugely impossible. OK, thank you. Professor? Yeah, uh, I guess starting off with um, Brexit. But um, obviously, in terms of... Um, materials and supply chain certainty and cost certainty of them, those materials and the impact it will have on, on, on the sector. Um, I can obviously speak from, from an educational standpoint as well in terms of, you know, we have a lot of students that, that come from, from Europe uh, and they represent a large talent pool for us, uh, both in the educational sector and then going on into industry. I can speak from a personal point of view in terms of the research centre that I operate. Uh, I have um, an Italian, a Bulgarian, Polish as well as Scottish, uh, and that, that creates and 50% uh, female diversity, which is great. Um, and we actually have a, a really good culture within the team with different skill sets and a blend of, of, of knowledge, which is, you know, uh, is inspiring. Uh, we just do not want to, to lose that, both in terms of the, the students that we're bringing in and, and what we're doing from a, a research perspective, and then bleeding that talent on, into, the, into the sector. Um, so, yeah, I think there's there are some there's some challenges ahead in, in that in that respect uh, because we don't want to lose the the sort of um, trajectory that, that we have um, from the the sector's point of view. Um, as we've sort of heard and touched upon, there's I guess there's a lot to do. There's a lot of um, lot of opportunities in the mix there um, for us to to, to embrace change uh, and and look at. As I spoke of earlier, the, the, the different drivers within that social, economic, and political context, and how they are ultimately resolved into a more industrialised approach, um, you know, and, and the opportunity that resides for us to to look at the synthesis of the, the supply chain uh, and the opportunity for us to to use um, our own resources to, to deliver on that as a, as a blended approach, because we're never going to have all the resources here. We're always going to have to to, to import as well. Um, so I think there's a there's a huge opportunity there. 
what I would like to we interface very closely with industry as it as it stands. I think with the new skills and knowledge that are required going forward, there's opportunity to do more of that uh, and, and interface directly with industry on live research uh, and industrial challenges, harnessing that student talent and almost utilising them on uh, almost live projects or at least um, you know a hypothesis of what is to be live and all that there's real learning taking place and that real learning is starting to to drive uh, future product process innovation in, into the into the sector, so I think that that interface could be could be closer. Uh, you know, and we've tried to, to to do some of that through the creation of things like the built environment exchange in Renapier, where we have student talent uh, interface directly with with organisations, and we provide mentorship in the, in that respect. Um, so I think we can start to address challenges and be more dynamic and agile on that front. And, and ultimately for, for those challenges to be uh, client client led and for the procurement process and business model of construction to change in order that innovation can 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 take place in a, in a quicker and more agile manner. Okay, thank you. And finally, Mr Caldwell. Uh, rather than repeat a lot of what's been said, I'll try and pick one or two other things because I pretty much agree with everything the guys have said. Um, Brexit challenges, um, We've done a survey of our supply chain, and perhaps slightly surprisingly, there was no major worries about it particularly, just a kind of bearing in period from the supply chain. From, from our perspective, we would be concerned about general industry and, in fact, just an economy slowdown as, as everybody tries to take in what's happening. Um, that always has a negative effect on construction. Um, increases in cost, both materials, because of potentially tariffs or availability. Um, Labour, obviously, we've talked before about people leaving the industry. That applies equally to experienced construction workers from Eastern Bloc in the main, uh, not only. Um, and a lot of our labour in the past 10, 15 years certainly has come from that source. Um, increased labour costs as a result of lower, uh, of, of lower numbers in, in it and, you know, just Occasionally, one at the moment is clients trying to transfer Brexit risk to the contractors, you know, whatever the outcome might be of it, any additional costs should be borne by ourselves. And we, I don't think in all cases that's fair um, and that, you know, we don't have that crystal ball the way that nobody seems to have. Um, challenges, um, resources uh, in the short term, I th hopefully we can deal with it in the long term by attracting the right people and then the right numbers into the industry through a lot of the measures we've discussed today. Uh, but we've certainly got to get to young people and make it make them realise that this is an exciting industry um, and there's a lot going on. And you can be very, very tech savvy and you use that in your daily life in construction now. Um, and I think we've got to learn how to maximise the benefits of digital construction, whether that be in building things better, uh, or whether that be in new construction techniques. And modern methods of construction, I think, erroneously, is sometimes get always considered to be volumetric uh, or, or leaning in that direction. It's not always. It just means we can do things better by, by being smarter. Uh, and, and it might be you bring components to site and still do it there, but you just do it better and smarter. So it's keeping our minds open to what those new ideas could be. Um, what can the government do? I think the guys have touched on continuity of, of workload, uh, if possible, you know, is, is hugely beneficial to us to both plan resource, but also plan development and innovation and, and whether an investment is worthwhile making. If we can see that pipeline ahead of us, it allows us to uh, make more secure investments and de-risk it from our perspective. Thank you very much. Thank you, Convino. All right. Thank you very much to our panel. Um, we'll uh, conclude this session now. I'll suspend the meeting. We'll move into private session. So thank you for coming in to all three of you. Thank you.